everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is Pharmacogenetics Guided Pharmacotherapy, Recent Developments and Implementation in Clinical Practice, and our sponsor is Agena Bioscience. Our panelists for today are Dr. Stefan Russman, Senior Consulting Physician at the Hearst Landon Hospital Group in Switzerland, and Dr. Robin Everts, Senior Manager for Scientific Affairs and Global Pharmacogenetics and Clinical Genetics Lead at Agena Bioscience. You can type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar screen. And if you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Russman. Please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to this webinar. Um, my title, as you can see, is rather clinical. And indeed, I'm not a specialist on molecular biology. I'm an MD, I'm a physician, I'm seeing patients every day. I'm prescribing medicines as a clinical pharmacologist. I also supervise the medication of um, colleagues. And uh, so I have a pretty broad look at um, pharmacotherapy in clinical practice. Um, in order to do um, pharmacogenetics, which I started a few years ago, I um, set up a pharmacogenetics uh, clinic in Zurich, Switzerland. I obviously lead a network. And uh, so I'm collaborating with a molecular biology lab, which is using the Agena technology. Uh, I also collaborate with a um, pharmacogenetics specialized clinical decision support service um, called Sonogain. And then myself, I'm not only concerned with pharmacogenetics, as I already mentioned, I'm also a clinical pharmacologist and I'm also a fully, fully trained pharmacoepidemiologist. And you will actually see that I will also bring a lot of pharmacoepidemiology perspective into today's webinar. Um, let's just have a look at the topic that I would like to cover today. Um, because this is really hands-on clinical pharmacology, um, pharmacogenetics, I would um, present you a lot of clinical cases that I've seen in the, in the recent past. And I want to use that to provide specific examples of drug gene interactions. And what we also have, if you open your eyes and do not only look at drug gene interactions, we also see a lot of drug-drug gene interactions and other which I call third factors. Um, I also want to address uh, openly the limitations of pharmacogenetics and clinical practice. Uh, I want to discuss the latest scientific evidence and guidelines and um, then, as I mentioned before, my pharmacoepi perspective will also play into this when I do a systematic analysis and also give you an outlook on the exciting and rapidly evolving field of pharmacogenetics. Well, um, I actually remember that already uh, around the year 2000, um, someone called out the decade of pharmacogenetics, and you may wonder, uh, what has actually arrived in clinic practice these days. They have a lot of promises been made related to pharmacogenetics, like it will change the field of pharmacotherapy, it will improve um, economic and um, patient outcomes, it will improve the whole uh, health system. Uh, here, for example, we have a white paper, which sounds pretty official, and it says uh, pharmacogenetics improves overall health system performance, economic benefits, and key decisions. Um, if, if the outlook is so positive, then we actually are at the point where we call for something um, that we call preemptive pharmacogenetics. Should we actually engage in performing pharmacogenetic analysis for all patients preemptively, in contrast to responsive pharmacogenetics, where we test for specific drug gene pairs uh, for the drugs that we are using or uh, are planning to use. So those are um, the two concepts uh, that we can actually see today in pharmacogenetics. And um, 
Uh, on the other side, actually, we have to be aware of the limitations before we engage on a broad uh, implementation of pharmacogenetics. We have seen a huge increase in our knowledge in genetics um, after the or through the whole genome project. But um, a really nice quote that I like to um, um, quote frequently is um, that our ability to analyze the whole genome has exceeded our knowledge how to interpret this information. And I think that's also something that we really have to keep in mind. Um, and I will uh, give you case presentations where you actually see that um, clinical medicine is highly complex and we should not actually expect that a simple gene test will answer all therapeutic uh, questions in clinical practice. Uh, the good thing, at least, and that is uh, actually quite different from disease genetics, in pharmacogenetics, we have hardly any ethical concerns. Um, it's, it's, I can hardly imagine the case where we get information from a pharmacogenetic test that puts us into an ethically different situation, like should we do invasive procedures like uh, uh, tumor surgery, preventive tumor surgery, that's not the case for pharmacogenetics. And that's actually why we have been able to, um, to implement our pharmacogenetics program. And for all our patients, thanks to the collaboration with uh, Agena and the, um, and the Molecular Biology Lab, we actually have um, the results of a whole pharmacogenetic panel in our patients. So here you can see the pharmacogenetic panel that we are actually using. Um, so we get 16 genes, which I think cover currently most of the um, uh, genes that are clinically relevant with uh, in, in relation to pharmacotherapy. Um, of course, there are other uh, genes uh, where we have to use a different technology, but this is what we get. So we do have some experience with uh, pharmacogenetic panel testing. We have recently also published those. If you're interested in the full text, um, you can read those uh, in the Journal of Clinical Medicine, uh, recently published uh, this summer. Um, so what are we using? Uh, or the lab that I'm working with, they're using the mass RA um, technology by Agena. And uh, the core is a PGX74 panel, uh, which has been adjusted to our special needs. So this is a technology that eventually provides the 16 gene panel results that I eventually get. And here's the design of our uh, analysis. This was an analysis of our first 135 patients that were included in our pharmacogenetics clinic. And you can see right away the, um, the difference between the indications. We have drug-specific indications, which is the majority of our patients. But we also have um, a certain number of patients who already came for pharmacogenetic screening. Those obviously are self-payers. And uh, one of the key features here is that I actually see every patient in person, and I do not only get the pharmacogenetic panel, I get the whole medical history, I get all the concomitant medication for those patients. And I think that makes a, a big difference in our uh, program that um, we really see the big picture here. Uh, then I also get the um, support by the, um, by the software, uh, clinical decision support software called Sonogen XP. And then after I get results, I see the patient again, or at least I write a comprehensive um, uh, report. And that's actually how we generated the results of this overview. We can actually say, well, for um, um, pharmacogenetics-based recommendations, what are the implications for the current medications and what might be recommendations for future medication? I think that's a, that's a way uh, to see pharmacogenetics. You always have a look at the, the current medications and any potential future medications. And um, 
One of the first things, obviously, that we want to know, what's the distribution of the genetic variants in our population? Well, this is not a surprise, but uh, we actually want to confirm that for our primarily Caucasian population, we have results that actually match what we expect. Fortunately, this is the case. For example, for the CYP2D6, you can really see the distribution in the different um, phenotypes um, that we would be expecting. And the phenotypes here are predicted from the genotypes. And we also see the same for DPYD, for example, which we have in the, in the lower right quarter of this uh, slide. And you, you can actually see how important it is that before you engage in um, sending out for a test, you, you have to have an idea what's the, what's the likelihood that I get uh, a certain result, a certain variant, because that predicts also the um, propensity that you will derive a clinical relevant decision based on that test. And um, here, for example, on the left side of the slide, we try to um, uh, to get a feeling for if, if we compare the frequency of variants in our population, will that relate to something that on guidelines we can interpret as actionable, recommended, or even required variants? So, for example, if you go to the lower panel, we can see that for um, uh, more than one third of the population, we actually see that uh, we find variants that, at least for a few potential future medication, um, the, the testing would be required. And then we have for recommended variants, obviously, we have an even higher percentage. And then what we also do is we look at um, how often do we actually change the current medication or make a, make a recommendation concerning a future medication based on the results of this 16-gene uh, pharmacogenetic panel? So that, for me, is very important um, in our learning experience, how relevant is actually pharmacogenetics in clinical practice, um, particularly the 16-gene panel that we are using. Um, so that was a kind of a little introduction, what we are doing here. And um, with that, I would like to come to the first case presentations. I've prepared six clinical cases, and I would uh, like to stimulate you to think about it. Um, usually, I do this in a much more interactive way, but uh, we have more than a uh, 200 precip uh, precipitants now, so um, we would have to postpone any discussions to the end, or of course you can also um, uh, write your questions in the um, appropriate field. Okay, so case number one, this is a patient um, who is supposed to get the anti-epileptic drug carbamazepine, and we know that the risk of um, severe skin reaction SJS or TEN is about one to six in 10,000 patients, but that only goes for the Caucasian population. We know that, for example, in the Asian population, the risk is a lot higher. And we also know the genetic variants that uh, predispose to that um, adverse drug reaction. Those are human leukocyte antigen variants. And there are actually two that have been described to have a strong association. Um, with the adverse outcome. And we also know the prevalence in Caucasian and Asian populations. So the question now is, do you recommend HLA genotyping before a prescription of carbamazepine? Um, well, there are two ways to, to look at this. First of all, uh, you can, of course, um, consult the, um, the national... Um, uh, prescribing information, um, but you can also go to the probably most valuable resource for pharmacogenetics. Uh, this is the Pharm GKB, uh, certainly the most comprehensive and uh, resource uh, where experts from all over the world contribute uh, their knowledge, where you find uh, cross-references, and where you also find uh, clinical annotation of levels of evidence. That's very helpful. You have level one, which means that there's a very high level 
for a clinically relevant effect of pharmacogenetic variants, and then that goes down to level two, three, and four. So what actually happens if we consult PharmGKB uh, concerning carbamazepine? Um, you will actually be surprised how much you find. Uh, for carbamazepine, we have 840 results. Um, but you can also see that this can very quickly get very confusing. We have not one level of evidence. It depends on the gene. It depends on the, on the clinical situation. Um, we have the um, prescribing information um, issued by the or influenced by the um, regulatory authority. And that, of course, can vary from country to country. Here for carbamazepine, uh, the FDA and Swiss Medic, they actually gave out um, a guideline which says testing is required. Um, but you can also see that doesn't is that it's not necessarily the same for HLA-B and HLA-A. Uh, maybe for other variants, it might only be a recommendation or it might only uh, be considered level three evidence. So you only have an actionable variation. So it's not black and white. It's not like testing, yes, no. You also have to decide what genes should I test on. And for carbamazepine, of course, you might come across a patient that has already used the drug for like two or three years without any adverse effects. And then, of course, you would not have to test anymore. So the more you look into detail, the more complex it gets, even for an apparently very clear indication to do pharmacogenetics, as it is for carbamazepine. Um, and for example, here, you can also um, ask the questions, if testing is required for HLA-B, if we have the technology to do HLA-A testing um, for essentially the same price, uh, wouldn't we immediately ask for testing for both variants? And if I had the opportunity, obviously, I would like to have the results for both. Um, so that was carbamazepine, um, one of the examples where we have a really high evidence on the clinical uh, on the association between a genetic variant and a life-threatening adverse event. Here, in case study number two, we have something else. We have a very common drug, metoprolol, and we all know that metoprolol is usually prescribed without pharmacogenetic testing. Um, However, isn't that surprising? Because we have very good evidence that um, the plasma levels and therefore the effects of metoprolol have a very strong association with CYP2D6 uh, pharmacogenetics. And we also know that the relevant variants are not a rarity. We know that the prevalence of CYP2D6 poor metabolizers is around 8% in Caucasian populations. So should we change our strategies would you recommend CYP2D6 genotyping before prescription of metoprolol? Um, let's have a look at PharmGKB first, and you will see that here it's only level three evidence. It's only actionable classification. Uh, so testing is not um, um, required or recommended. It's just actionable. And if you think about the facts and how we prescribe and um, actually monitor the therapy with metoprolol, this is not a surprise because metoprolol is like a prototype drug where you can monitor the clinical effects of the drug right away. We all know that if we measure the blood pressure and the uh, heart rate, we have a very good idea of um, how effective the drug is in our uh, specific patient. So usually this is not necessary because we have an excellent possibility to monitor the clinical effects of the drug. And that's certainly a general argument that speaks against uh, pharmacogenetic testing. Even if the association between stronger effects and the genetic variant is uh, unquestioned. Um, having said that, uh, I have seen patients which had been started metoprolol for the indication of heart failure, 
And uh, as you all know, you start there with very low doses, and we have actually seen patients being pushed over the edge, uh, probably because they have been poor metabolizers. So maybe if I had the information that this patient is a poor metabolizer before, then I would either use an extremely low dose or probably switch to another better blocker, which is not metabolized via CYP2D6. But that actually is an argument for a role of preemptive pharmacogenetic testing for better blocker therapy. Um, in the third case, I would like to use the um, example of uh, tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is used for secondary prevention of um, ER expressing um, breast cancer. And tamoxifen is also metabolized via CYP2D6. Uh, the prevalence, again, as we have heard, is around 8%. So it's not a rare variant. So the question here is, would you expect that a poor metabolizer would have higher tamoxifen concentrations leading to higher efficacy of tamoxifen therapy? Let's have a look at the mechanism of action of tamoxifen. And the first thing that we learn is that tamoxifen is actually a prodrug. So here the effect of the pharmacogenetic variant um, with a poor metabolizer would be vice versa we would have in a poor metabolizer, we would have less bioactivation of the tamoxifen to its um, active metabolite endoxifen. And um, so here, the, um, the poor metabolizer would be expected to have a lower efficacy of the drug. And that actually has been shown in several prospective clinical studies. Uh, we also have to think about our clinical options for the management. For example, what do we do if we have a patient where therapeutic drug monitoring of the active metabolite endoxifen has already been done? Um, maybe then pharmacogenetic testing um, would not be necessary anymore. Um, and we can ask ourselves, do we have clear guidelines here? What we also have to ask ourselves, what would be the alternative? If we don't have any alternatives, pharmacogenetic testing might not be very helpful. Um, so fortunately here, we have very clear guidelines. Of course, you would also find a reference to this publications on PharmGKB. And um, here, this is an example for a very specific um, clinically oriented guideline. So. This guideline actually tells us that if we have an ultra-rapid metabolizer uh, where we would expect a high um, bioactivation of tamoxifen, we wouldn't have to worry. So here, no surprise, the classification of the recommendation is strong. And the therapeutic recommendation is also obvious. Uh, you just carry on with the therapy as planned. The same for the normal metabolizer. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a very poor metabolizer, there's also very strong evidence that uh, you should uh, straight away um, consider taking an alternative drug like anastosol. And then we have all these categories in between, the intermediate metabolizer, where the uh, metabolism is only mildly impaired. And there we can immediately see the classification of the recommendation is only moderate or optional. And here we might actually engage in a kind of a hybrid strategy. Maybe we want to adjust the dose. Um, maybe we want to do additional uh, therapeutic drug monitoring of endoxifen. And of course, um, it also depends on the side effects. If a patient tolerates tamoxifen very well, uh, that might be a motivation to, um, to stick to the therapy if the endoxifen plasma levels are good. And um, on the other hand, we always have to consider that anastrozole usually is less well tolerated. So here we have very strong guidelines, but what is really surprising, if you look at what is happening, at least in Switzerland, but I think that also applies to other countries, first look, let's look at, have a look at our national um, summary of product characteristics. So what does the manufacturer 
uh, recommend. Well, first, you do get the information that tamoxifen efficacy expected to be reduced in CYP2D6 poor metabolizers. Uh, they also give us a very important information that uh, if you add a CYP2D6 inhibitors, you might have um, endoxifen concentrations that are only as low as 25%. Um, and therefore, they make the deduction that paroxetine, a strong CYP2D6 inhibitor, um, should not be used uh, in combination with tamoxifen. But here's something very surprising. Then you go to the pharmacokinetic data again, and you can actually see that the effect of a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer from pharmacokinetic point of view is exactly the same. You also have expect the same 75% lower endoxifen concentration, but here you do not have a specific recommendations. You can you can actually see um, that this is a bit inconclusive, and uh, obviously it's not how it should be. We should actually expect that if we have a, the same pharmacokinetic consequences, you would expect the same recommendations. So if we look at the tamoxifen issue again, here in, in very contrast to metoprolol, we have, if it happens, we have an irreversible outcome with limited monitoring options. So I'm talking about the recurrence of um, breast cancer. We have a role of active metabolites. We do have an alternative strategy. And um, uh, what, what is a bit frustrating is that uh, apparently several studies, they had a lack of power and they had been in my opinion, rather misinterpreted as negative uh, studies for the role of pharmacogenetics. Um, I would very much concur with the uh, uh, guideline um, uh, that actually recommends um, uh, pharmacogenetic testing. And uh, if someone wants to use TDM, that would be an alternative for me. But there are a lot of women in this country and in other countries where tamoxifen therapy is done, and um, we are actually doing a black box therapy we do, because we do not have either the pharmacogenetic information nor the um, endoxifen plasma level. So I think he has a lot of work to do. And with that, uh, let's go to the next example. I think that's a really shining example for the role of pharmacogenetics. Uh, let's assume we have a 78-year-old patient with ischemic, ischemic stroke, and this patient is taking aspirin. And um, uh, now this patient um, is uh, switched to clopidogrel um, because apparently he had a stroke under th during therapy with aspirin. So the neurologist here wants to apply an augmentation strategy. So... Aspirin is switched to clopidogrel, but clopidogrel, again, is a prodrug just like uh, tamoxifen. And in this case, it's not CYP2D6, it's CYP2C19 involved. And CYP2C19 is also subject to um, a pharmacogenetic uh, polymorphism. So we have intermediate metabolizers and we have poor metabolizers. And um, so the question is, would you do preemptive CYP2C19 testing before a switch to clopidogrel? Or would you even consider a switch right away to the alternative drug uh, Prazogrel, which is not affected by uh, CYP2C19 polymorphisms? Um, let's have a closer look at this. It's a shining example of pharmacogenetics because probably there are a few drug gene pairs for which we have such a good evidence. We have um, prospective uh, clinical studies uh, that compared uh, um, pharmacogenetic guided therapy versus standard therapy. So here is, is one of those publications from the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, Klaassens published in 2019. And they compared ticagrelor or prazogrel as a standard therapy uh, versus CYP2C19 genotype-guided 
uh, therapy, which means if you are an extensive metabolizer, if you are able to bioactivate clopidogrel, you would be assigned to clopidogrel therapy. And uh, if you are um, deficient bioactivator, you would uh, be assigned to a ticagrel or prosegrel um, regimen. And um, that is versus the uh, standard therapy of um, ticagrel or prosegrel right away. Mm -hmm. And we can actually see on the right side for both efficacy and safety outcomes um, that the pharmacogenetics guided therapy is at least non-inferior or even superior to the standard therapy. It is at least non-inferior uh, regarding the efficacy and it's superior regarding um, bleeding outcomes. Um, and that is actually a known issue, that the bleeding risk is higher with the, um, the latest um, um, drugs, uh, Ticagrel or Prozogrel, that can be used as an alternative to Clopidogrel. This has more or less been replicated, this um, result, in another study, here, the comparison group is a little bit different. Here, the standard therapy was standard clopidogrel therapy without uh, genotyping versus genotype-guided therapy. And here, we can actually see a similar picture. Uh, just that, of course, if you take clopidogrel as a standard therapy, you do not expect higher bleeding rates um, but um, you can actually see that uh, the, the efficacy outcomes are superior here, which is not surprising because uh, you can actually say probably the difference in the efficacy be uh, between Ticagrel and, um, and um, Prasogrel compared to uh, Clopidogrel can be actually be related to the 30% uh, of people who have an insufficient bioactivation of clopidogrel. So that was a confirmative um, result. I was very unhappy about the interpretation or rather misinterpretation because this study lacked from, um, 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 from insufficient statistical power. Uh, 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 a positive uh, thing is that recently the author published a meta-analysis meta and here you can actually uh, see that if you if you um, using this data in meta analysis, uh, it actually supports uh, the role of um, pharmacogenetics. Uh, we have done the same for um, our own um, patients. We have done uh, a pharmacogenetics guided uh, therapy. Uh, we haven't been able to do preemptive testing in all of our patients. We had to be responsive in some of them, but at least we wanted to see if we can at least replicate these results. And uh, we have actually been able to do this. Our um, uh, study, of course, um, has a significant lack of statistical power, but nevertheless, uh, we were actually able to replicate the same um, um, point estimates that we would expect. And um, we we had the same um, um, uh, prevalence of intermediate metabolizers in our population as we would have predicted from the literature. And what is very important that if if we actually detected uh, an intermediate metabolizer, we would uh, make clinical recommendations how to change the therapy. And in the majority of patients, we were actually able to implement a change of therapy um, after discussions with the colleagues from cardiology, vascular medicine, or neurology. What is also important, uh, remember the patient that I initially presented to you, it was a patient who was switched from aspirin monotherapy to clopidogrel monotherapy. And um, here it is important that it actually uh, could show if you are only on, on uh, monotherapy um, with clopidogrel, this is actually a factor that uh, makes pharmacogenetic testing even more important because you rely to 100% for your protection on the efficacy of clopidogrel. You do not have aspirin anymore. So particularly in patients um, with a monotherapy, 
for clopidogrel, grail, I think um, uh, there's a very strong argument uh, to do preemptive pharmacogenetic testing. Um, what we can also do here, we can take a closer look um, at some uh, public health um, aspects, which means number needed to test uh, that can be calculated. So if you compare pharmacogenetic guided um, uh, clopidogrel therapy based on the results by Klassen, you can actually calculate that it takes 125 patients to be tested to prevent one ischemic event. If you want to prevent one major bleeding event, the number is only 37. And if you want to prevent either one or the other, you only need to test 28 patients. And uh, for the Pereira study, the author did the calculations by himself, and he came actually to a similar number. He calculated a number of 55 patients to be tested to prevent one ischemic event. And consider how severe ischemic event is. That could be a myocardial infarction. It could be a stroke. And that, of course, is a major irreversible event, which also implies a lot of healthcare costs. And... Those numbers are also interesting because you can prevent, uh, you can compare those with what we are willed to pay, for example, to statin therapy, to cholesterol lowering therapy. So, if we want to prevent one ischemic event, we need to treat 100 patients with atorvastatin for three years, uh, which also implies significant costs and a significant burden of potential adverse effects. Uh, another important point are the costs. Uh, clopidogrel is available as a generic drug and is um, a lot less expensive than the therapy with clazogrel uh, or ticagrelor. Here I calculated the numbers for Switzerland, and you can see that not even considering the better um, efficacy and safety outcomes, you would also uh, be able to save a lot of money because um, a patient on FEN costs approximately $300 more per year and um, a patient on Ticagrelor costs about $650 more than a patient on Clopidogrel. So there are also economic arguments here that argue for um, the um, pharmacogenetic testing for clopidogrel therapy. And those, of course, are only the numbers for Caucasian populations. In Asian populations, those numbers would, e for the number needed to test, would be lower. Uh, let's come to the case study number five. We have a 62-year-old patient um, with a myocardial infarction. And, uh, well, besides the clopidogrel therapy, this patient might also be eligible for uh, cholesterol-lowering therapy with a statin. Uh, and uh, we know that statin therapy is also significant for pharmacogenetics because we have the SLCO1B1 variant. And this is actually one of, also another one of the shining examples in pharmacogenetics. Many of you may know this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. Um, it was certainly a landmark study because here, uh, for the first time, data from the phase three clinical trial was used to do a whole genome study. And here, the association between the SLCO1 B1 variant and the adverse outcome of myopathy um, could be clearly established. So let's have a closer look at the results. This is uh, a figure from the original publication. And the first thing you see is that the relative risk is really impressive. So if you're homozygous for the relevant variation in the SLCO1B1 gene, which encodes for a statin transporter, uh, you have a relative risk of almost 70, and that is statistically highly significant. You all, even if you are only homozygous, you ha still have a high uh, relative risk of 4.5, and that is also clinically um, that is also statistically significant. But there are a few other questions that we have to ask ourselves 
before we want to recommend pharmacogenetic testing. Well, first of all, we have to ask, what's the prevalence of this variant in our population? And you can see, although the relative risk for the high homozygous is almost 17, um, they only make up for 2% in the Caucasian population. Uh, for the heterozygous, uh, it's, it's a lot more. It's 25% approximately. But what you also have to consider is what is the absolute risk. You should not only focus on the relative risk, uh, you should only focus on the absolute risk of developing myopathy as the, uh, as the um, adverse outcome here. And you can see here on, on the left side, the, the y-axis obviously doesn't go to 100. Uh, so the effect is actually uh, visually exaggerated. Even if you are homozygous, your absolute risk to develop myopathy is still well below 20%. And if you are heterozygous, your absolute risk to develop myopathy is well below 5%. So this is a very important example for something that I would really like to emphasize um, when we talk about pharmacogenetics, that association is not prediction. So even if you have a positive test, it doesn't predict a high clinically um, relevant risk of developing the outcome of interest, myopathy here. And then, of course, you also have to ask yourself, how can you manage this? Is this a case of tamoxifen or clopidogrel where the potential uh, effect of a genetic variant would be an irreversible and potentially lethal event? Um, that cannot be monitored? No, here indeed it is the exact opposite. Uh, if you inform the patient about the um, clinical signs and symptoms of, um, of myopathy, if you do a, a creatine kinase monitoring, then you can manage this potential uh, adverse outcome clinically pretty well without pharmacogenetics. And then you may also consider that there also is a next generation of statin-lowering drugs, the, um, the PCASK9 inhibitors. And once they are on the market, and what they actually already are on the market, but once they come down in the price, that might actually be an alternative, um, which uh, would make SRCO1B1 genotyping um, unnecessary. Um, so let's come to the last case. Um, this is a, a patient with uh, metastatic colon cancer, and he would qualify for chemotherapy with capicitabine, which is an F 5-FU uh, prodrug. And here we know that the DPYD um, is subject to genetic polymorphisms and it mediates 5-FU detoxification. So we know there's a pretty strong correlation between uh, a deficiency in DPYD and adverse dose-dependent outcomes, mainly mucositis and um, colitis. And, um, so uh, what could we do here? We could do the phenotyping. And again, we have to ask ourselves what's the probability that we actually um, have a patient in front of us with that uh, deficiency. We know the prevalence in Caucasian populations, also in other populations. Um, even the partial deficiency is considered to be clinically relevant. And here we have a prevalence of about 3 to 9%. And then we have a complete deficiency, which here indeed is a strong predictor of um, uh, clinically highly relevant toxicity. And so once this association, and not only the association, but also the predictive power is well established, the question is, would you recommend preemptive DPYD uh, genetic testing? Again, we can go to PharmGKB, and here we can actually see uh, there is a discrepancy between the current recommendations uh, by the European Medicine Agency and the FDA. The FDA has classified it currently only as an actionable genetic variant, whereas testing has now been recommended in Europe. Recommended is still not required. So 
we are still in a situation where it is not clear uh, if actually everyone should do it or if actually everybody um, uh, should be required to do it. Uh, currently, it is not required, but um, uh, I've, I've uh, spoken to some colleagues in oncology. Some apply it regularly, some don't apply it at all. So this is not a satisfying situation. Okay, so DPYD, um, you will also hear uh, a bit more about it, DPYD by the next presenter. And it's, for me, it's time to uh, come to some concluding um, slides. So that there are a lot of factors that affect the clinical relevance of PGX testing. And we always have to remember that the clinical uh, decisions um, that are affected by pharmacogenetic testing they are multifactorial and they are highly complex. So we should not expect that a simple pharmacogenetic test gives us a clear-cut answer how to manage a patient. And there are a lot of things uh, that we discussed um, during this presentation that play an important role. And if there's one thing that I would really emphasize, please always remember for a clinical um, or for, for a clinician, Association is not enough. Association does not equal prediction, and even prediction does not necessarily um, uh, equal clinical relevance. Um, we also discuss considerations regarding the cost efficiency of pharmacogenetic testing. And um, here something is very important that the cost efficiency obviously is very much dependent on scaling effects. Uh, for example, think about that right now, millions of people worldwide are tested for COVID-19 with PCR tests, which essentially is the same technology as pharmacogenetic testing. And apparently all health systems have enough resources to do genetic testing in the COVID-19 situation, even do repeated testing. Um, if we wanted to do preemptive pharmacogenetic testing, testing once in a lifetime would be sufficient and we would have enormous scaling effects. So probably we would be able to, uh, to offer a genetic panel testing for the same price or for the same cost as, um, as COVID-19 PCR testing. And um, so I have here some concluding key points uh, that I would uh, like to emphasize towards the end of this presentation. So there's increasing evidence for the efficacy uh, and efficient daily use of pharmacogenetic guided pharmacotherapy. Again, um, my key message, association does not equal prediction and pr even prediction does not equal clinical relevance. Um, nevertheless, we have some selected drug gene pairs even today with an extremely high level of evidence. And those are pairs where I would certainly recommend uh, pharmacogenetic uh, testing on a broader scale than it's currently done. Um, we also um, have uh, PharmGKB for anybody who's interested in uh, getting more information about uh, how to use and apply pharmacogenetics. This is the single most valuable publicly available source of information. Um, what is also interesting, we still have currently very limited knowledge on so-called third factors. If you consider, for example, a case that we are currently working on where we have a drug-drug gene uh, interaction, uh, that can actually potentiate the effects of pharmacogenetic uh, variations. Um, always remember that PGX-guided treatment decisions are not the same as a ph simple pharmacogenetic test. So you should not call a pharmacogenetic test personalized medicine. Pers real pharmacogenetic-based personalized medicine involves a lot more. And of course, you need a network um, of, um, of clinicians, of clinical pharmacologists, of pharmacists. You need the laboratory. You need innovative hardware and software solutions for the successful implementation of uh, pharmacogenetics program. So this would be the end of my presentation. So we have another short presentation and then we are open to 
questions and comments. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosen, for your, your great presentation. Um, I, I think, um, speaking for everybody here, that, um, you know, this hits home really well. Um, I, I have been working in um, PGX for the last 10, 15 years here at the Gene of Biosciences, and, and especially your case number two with Metaprolol actually hit home for me because three months ago, I was actually given that medicine one time, and within 10 minutes, I had 10 people in my room, including a crash cart, and luckily everything worked well, and I'm still here, so, and I can do this presentation, but, uh, you know, undergoing one of those uh, adverse drug reactions uh, shows you how important PGX actually is. So, I am here to talk about the mass array system from Agena Bioscience and give some background on the mass array system. So. Agena Biosciences is a global company with offices in San Diego, Hamburg, Shanghai, and Brisbane. And we actually do targeted uh, genotyping, um, which is very affordable. And that's also very important to, to understand, just uh, as Dr. Rosman talked about, there are certain key important points that, that need to be addressed. And so what we try to do is, is get you a very robust performance with, with very accurate results, so you don't need running samples in duplicate or repeat samples. Um, we also are um, work, wait, working on getting you comprehensive detection. So not just giving you SNP genotyping or indels, but do all the same things, including copy number variations, for instance, like for SIP 6 on the same platform and then the same workflow. And then, of course, it has to be cost effective because, yeah, as, as Dr. Rosman said, if you have to type 100 people in order to find one uh, ADR, then of course you want to make it sure that it's not too expensive in order to be able to do that. As such, Agena has developed uh, a number of panels and um, I, I know Dr. Rothman referred to the PJX 74. Um, that actually is very similar to what we have here on the left side, which is the Veritas core panel. Um, the Veritas core panel is the PJX 74, but then we have made some minor improvements to it. Um, but you can see all the important genes are in there, APOs, the SIP, SIP genes, uh, factor five, factor two, MTHFR, SLOCO 1B1 is also in there. So all the, the important genes are there in order to do your basic genotyping. We also came out with another panel more recently, which is called the Veridose DPYD panel. Um, this is also something that uh, Dr. Rothman referred to in, his, uh, in one of his case studies. Um, this panel actually includes nine different mutations in the uh, DPYD gene, and at least six of those are recommended to genotype, and the other three also have evidence that there is uh, an effect on, on a drug uh, metabol metabolism, metabolism. And lastly, the other panel that we have uh, readily available is the uh, cip 6 CNV panel. So what we have done is we have developed a panel that targets seven different regions in the cip 6 gene, and that is all being done in one reaction. And so we can not only tell you accurately what the copy number is of the gene overall, but we can also tell you whether there are hybrid genes present. Um, and within CYP36, there are definitely, uh, in certain populations, there are a high number of hybrid alleles, which are non-functional, but if you only genotype on one side in the gene, you might actually miss out on those, and you might overcall or undercall the copy number um, that is actually affecting drug metabolism. So how does the technology work for Agena Biosciences? We call it the IPLEX uh, genotyping method. And we, what we do is we genotype in a PCR reaction up to about 30 different SNPs of interest in the same reaction. So one reaction is gonna be 30 different SNPs. Um, after the PCR amplification, we have a step where we remove all the leftover nucleotides that are in the mix, and then we add in a third primer called the extension primer, which maps right next to the um, SNP of interest. Uh, you can see here it maps right next to the A or the G. And what we actually do is we have a different nucleotide in there in the mix also. We actually have all four different, what we call terminator molecules in there, A, C, G, and T. So the enzyme that we use in the reaction will incorporate uh, the correct base here. 
So in this case, if the, the source is T, it will incorporate an A. If the source is a C, it will incorporate a G. And then we fly that product on the mass array, our platform, and you can in real time see all the peaks that are developing. So you can see peaks for other assays in there which are non-annotated. And you can also look at the, the assay that you're looking for, the A and G. And so you cannot, it's not only um, qualitative, it's not only it gives you the outcome, it, it's, it's also quantitative. So it also can tell you something about the uh, prep, the, the relevant, uh, relative proportion of each allele. Oh, wrong button. So in how, how it works is that we develop a, a extension primer, which is a certain mass. And we vary the extension primers in length by, by making them between 15 to 30 bases. And, that, that, and then we calculate what the inclusion of the terminator molecule is. In this case, with it, the primer plus a T is going to be 6058, 51.8 Dalton. If you have a G incorporated instead of a T, it's going to be 6011.9 Dalton, et cetera. And on the right side, you can see these different colors also, the C, the A, the G, and the T. They actually resemble the different possibilities from the bottom to the top. And you can clearly see that in this case, for this sample, there is a C peak and there's a G peak. So we can t definitely tell this is a sample with a C and a G allele. Um, if this were a CYP26 assay, we could say the G allele is twice as prevalent as the C allele. So if this sample were to be a three copy sample, then we would expect the allele associated with the G allele to be at two copies there, whereas the C allele would be one copy. So we, we cannot only say what alleles are present, we can also say something about quantity of the alleles and, and whether there is duplication or not, and, and which allele is duplicated. So going to the, um, so, so we, we perform, we, we have a technology that does all the genotyping. Um, when it comes to reporting, um, our software actually provides very simple CSV output files. It, it's just the sample, the assay, and then the call. And there are multiple companies out there that can pick up that, uh, that output and actually make a report out of it. You can see here all the companies that we have worked with or are working with. Um, and as, as Dr. Rutten said, he worked with Sonogon XP, the one in the middle here. Um, but there are definitely other companies also outside uh, Europe, like in America, we do work with the, some of the companies on the bottom also. Uh, one notable user of our technology um, is uh, Myriad Neuroscience. Um, they actually developed a, the gene site test onto our platform several years ago. Um, they found actually that by doing um, a preemptive pharmacogenetics, you can have a 50% improvement in, in results in remission of, um, of uh, problems. And up to now, uh, they have genotyped over a million samples. Um, and it's being used by more than 23,000 healthcare workers, and patients are more than twice as likely to respond to, to the drugs uh, after they, they get a pharmacogenetics test done. So all in all, um, what I want to show you here is like uh, what the mass array system from Agena Biosciences is. It's actually a targeted, actional, a targeted mutation uh, analysis. Um, it's very cost effective depending on what you're running. It can be from the teens to hundreds of dollars. Um, it has an efficient workflow. It can be turnaround data in one day, and it's customizable. I have given you um, samples of, of the panels we have available. We also have an assets by Agena servers where we can make custom panels. So if, if you have other interests, we can definitely work with you. Um, and this platform has been shown to be work, working really well in, in not only pharmacogenetics, but also in, um, in oncology, in hereditary diseases, uh, especially uh, thinking CFTR. And, and the other um, area we work in a lot is sample integrity. Um, so this is a short presentation on what uh, Agena does and what we can do for you. And um, I think we have uh, a few minutes left for questions, if there are any. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Everts. Um, as a reminder to webinar participants, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. 
Um, all right, so uh, Dr. Russman, our first question is for you. Um, so the limitations on reimbursement seem to be from the payers generally only wanting to cover single gene drug tests rather than panels. Uh, could you tell us how you're working through this and if there's anyone that's actively trying to change payer coverage uh, to push for PGX panels instead of single gene tests? Um, yeah, I, I can only confirm mm -hmm. that the reimbursement is really a major current limitation for um, the implementation of pharmacogenetics in clinical practice. And I've already given you the example for um, when, when we compare this for the widespread COVID-19 PCR testing, that, that really appears amazing that we have at least 20 years of evidence on the usefulness of pharmacogenetics and we are still very hesitant to, to implement it in a broader scale. In Switzerland, we have a very special situation that um, if a board-certified clinical pharmacologist supports the indication for pharmacogenetic testing, um, it is actually reimbursed. And that's how I, as a clinical pharmacologist, am able to, uh, to perform all those tests. Um, what we also have, we know because the, the Agena um, mass array solution is so efficient, we have been able to um, to work um, to work out a deal where we get the whole panel. But but that's a really interesting. Then, if you think about uh, testing, once you decide to test one gene with the new uh, technology that is now available, it's only a very small step to do um, to do panel testing. So I could imagine once we step into the, a, a broader implementation of pharmacogenetics, um, it's only a small step to um, to preemptive uh, panel-based testing. Yeah, and of course that that would be interesting because uh, we have shown with our results that our our rate of detection of clinically relevant variations with the, the panel that we are using, it's essentially 100%. Every person walking on this planet has variants that are potentially relevant for pharmacotherapy, current or future pharmacotherapy. Uh, and Stefan, uh, could you tell us why you use Malditoff instead of next-gen sequencing? Um, and as a follow-up to Robin, could you tell us what the advantages of testing for DPYD with the GINAS method as compared to something more comprehensive like NGS? Um, I can actually pass this question right away to, to Robin because I said I'm, I'm not the molecular biologist and sure. I really work with what the lab provides. I'm very happy with the solution, with the Agena technology and the service that we have from the Laborage and Sonogain, but I'm actually not the one who decided on the technology. So I will pass on to Robin. <laughs> thank you, thank you for a hard question to me, Jan. Um, so, I, I, I mean, there, there, there's a place for, for next gen sequencing, definitely. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a um, great technology. Um, but once you talk about um, pharmacogenetics, and if you look at what, what uh, the FDA or the Swiss or, or the European Union are, are requiring or what they, where there's evidence for, it's a very limited number of, of data points. Um, so the question there becomes, you know, do you go... Net NGS, do you go sequencing or do you go like targeted genotyping? Um, and to me, especially also in the light of the reimbursement issues, I, I think going targeted genotyping might be the, the more uh, cost effective way and also the faster way in a lot of cases. So there is definitely, I, I think, um, for, for those things, um, targeted genotyping would be a, a lot more advantageous. Um, and especially like if you look at CYP2, uh, sorry, at DPYD, so you talk about nine mutations here that, that are most likely the ones that, 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 that cause most of the issues. Um, so if, if you look at a, at a population-wide uh, strategy, then, then going for just those nice mutations, nine mutations might be the fastest and most cost-effective way. Um, and if you go sequencing, yeah, you might find other mutations out there, but they might be very, very rare um, we don't know what they do, and, and the question is going to be, if, they, if you know at some point what they do, it's easy for the ones that are really relevant to just make a smaller panel. So um, <laughs> I, I think there's a time and place for both, but uh, for right now, targeted genotyping is, is the way to go. 
Great. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are over our time, so I'm going to wrap it up there. We'd like to thank uh, Stefan Russman, Robin Everts, and our sponsor, Agena Bioscience. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. And as always, if you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.